Oh, it's not holding. Hey, this is Cam with Blacktail Studio, and it takes a lot to surprise me when it comes to the things that I'm building, and I can unequivocally say that I have never been more surprised by the outcome of a project than this project here. And first off, because when I started this project, I didn't even know what I was making. I first wanted to see if I could mix a few different colors of epoxy and kind of make an ombre effect, and I thought that'd be the end of it. I thought that would be as cool as it could possibly be for this type of project. So what I did is I got my wife enlisted. She came out, helped me mix, helped me find the perfect colors because as I've mentioned before, I'm colorblind. So I got her out there. We had a little bit of fun mixing the colors and this apparently was just the start. I did not know how far I was gonna take this project and honestly, I did not think it was gonna work. Whoa, Jesus. As you can hear, my wife is extremely helpful when it comes to choosing this perfect color, but I really brought this on myself because I was shocked at the number of paint samples she got for the inside of our house when we painted it. So much so that I asked the guy at the paint store, I said, hey, what is the most samples anybody's ever gotten for a room? And he goes, oh man, this one time someone got like 30 samples. My wife got 60 samples, 60 samples for the inside of a house. Anyway, I digress. And we finally got ready for this pour and we opted not to use a tripod for some reason. And I'll just let this play out. Oh, it's not holding. It goes right underneath it. Hold it down, yeah, you hold it down now. That's what I kind of thought might happen, but it's okay. Jesus, it's floating away. <laughs> hold it. This alone is very ombre-like. Ooh. Okay, this is pretty. Maybe we should have used the tripod. <laughs> you got it? Uh-huh. Oh, shit. It's all right, it's all right. Jesus. That looks hilarious. <laughs> as long as I've been working with wood and epoxy, people from the woodworking community have been telling me that I am not a real woodworker and that just mixing wood and epoxy does not equal woodworking. So finally, I am trying to earn the respect of my peers and I'm no longer mixing wood and epoxy. And this solid epoxy project is the one that I am hoping that they finally recognize my skills and qualify me as a real woodworker. I mentioned earlier that the end result of this project really surprised me and that could not be more of an understatement. And this part didn't really surprise me. I figured I'd be able to mix a few colors together, let them blend in a mold and it should look pretty cool. And it does. But the finished product at the end of this video that I didn't even know the direction that this project was going to take at this point in the build was probably the single project that I am most proud of out of everything I've built. So much so that instead of selling this in honor of the upcoming 2 million subscribers that I hopefully get to, I'm not there yet, I'm at like 1.9 as of the time I'm filming this, I'm going to be giving this project away to one of you guys and there'll be details in the video description or later in the video. So if you're interested in winning this project, I will ship this anywhere in the world because most of my viewers come from outside the US. So I don't want to limit this to just US viewers. So link in the description or more details later in this video. At the end of my last video, I asked people to start their question or comment with the bald celebrity they thought that I most closely resembled and I would choose my favorite one and give them a shout out in a future video. And we had so many good submissions that I actually have two. We have a crowd favorite and a personal favorite. And first off, the crowd favorite. That one comes from Complexities, and they said that I most closely resemble Johnny Sins. And if you do not want to admit where you know Johnny Sins from, just play it safe and say that you know Johnny Sins from his YouTube channel and nothing else on the internet. However, my personal favorite comes from James Jim, and it was a Japanese saw restoration video, and he said that it most closely resembled Mr. Sparkle. And I'm also partial because I'm a big Vintage Simpsons fan, so thanks to everybody that gave their submissions, and especially to James Jim and Complexities. If you look through my past videos, you'll see that I generally gravitate towards pretty sharp edges. I like things like a really sharp 90 degree waterfall edge or a 22 degree chamfer that I end up putting on most of my tables. And so this time I want to do something a little bit different. And so I am using this two and a half inch radius bit on my router table and I'm just softening these edges. I'm giving them a nice curved radius 
because the next step that I'm gonna take is pretty ridiculous. It is something that not only have I never tried before, I want to go as bold as to say, I don't think anybody on the internet has done this before. And I've never said that before because I feel like the internet is too big of a place and everything has already been done. So if you can find this anywhere on the internet, leave a comment with a link to that and I will post a public retraction because I don't think anybody is stupid enough to try this. And I end up risking this thousand dollar chunk of epoxy for something that I didn't even think was going to work. But before I could do that, I had to build a form and this is just a big box with a solid curved radius which is what i'm doing here at this point i should probably say that i'm building a box just like real woodworkers do when they want to do those really cool curved bent laminations or steam bending however i don't actually know how to do that and so what i am basing this entire design on is a series of memories that I have where I've seen Instagram clips of people bending wood with either steam or just those bent laminations and hoping that the same thing can possibly apply to trying to bend a big solid brick of epoxy. And the reason I want to give this disclaimer is because I don't want anybody who wants to try the real bent laminations or steam bending to copy this design because I'm sure it's the wrong way to do it. However, if there are any real woodworkers out there that know how to properly build these boxes, definitely leave me a comment and let me know how this design can be improved upon because I left plenty of room for improvement. And all I'm doing here is just cutting a bunch of two by fours that will act as the support and help me build this giant curved form. Some of you are probably correctly starting to wonder how exactly does he think he's going to bend this solid brick of epoxy? It is fully cured. Before epoxy is completely cured, it tends to be a little bit gummy and a little bit flexible. However, this is cured for over a year and a half. It is rock hard. There is zero flex in it. You might think that you could do this if you just poured it and then try to bend it in the first week. However, you couldn't surface it like I did. So I have it perfectly consistent and flat and you wouldn't be able to do that with the kind of gummy epoxy. So I don't think you could do it that way. And the inspiration behind this idea comes from a friend of mine who was installing an epoxy table and while they were getting the house ready for it they had it sitting out in the sun and in just a few minutes the center of the table started to taco started to sag from the heat so what i'm doing is i'm going to see if i can do that on purpose i'm going to use the sun to try to heat this up and bend it over this epoxy form or not epoxy form but whatever you call this bent form the first thing I learned though is don't use this hardboard. That does not flex and was a horrible idea to use there. So went back, got some thin plywood that I'm gonna cut some kerfs in because I also tried to bend this and it did not wanna bend either. And at this point, I did not know if this was gonna work, but again, I was in for a penny, in for a pound. I'm all in, I'm gonna see if I can make this work. And it's a pretty big investment at this point between the money of epoxy and the materials and most importantly, the time. So. We don't get a lot of 100 degree days in Oregon and I had a four day stretch where it's supposed to be over 100 every single day. So this was probably my last opportunity for the year to try this project. I was pretty inspired by how well cutting those kerfs and that thin plywood allowed it to bend around this radius. And so now I just needed to find a way to attach it as perfect as I possibly could. And I knew it wouldn't be hard to get it attached in some fashion, However, what was going to be really critical was getting it as smooth as I possibly could because unlike bending wood where the wood is going to kind of naturally bend in a radius, this epoxy, once it heats up, it'll allow itself to be dented or kinked or anything like that. So if there's any lumps or defects in it, that epoxy is going to soak it up. So added some glue, added some clamps, and here's what we got. So you think it's going to work? Oh, this? I, I think there's a 10% chance of it working, but if it does, it's cool 10%. Yeah. I just said, I usually have a pretty good idea, like when something's a good idea and when it's not. This is one of those that doesn't seem like a good idea, but you never know until you try. Also, this is pretty shoddy. Just a little lumpy. Little lumpy, yep. Yeah. 
for once, the weather was actually cooperating. The high today was supposed to be about 104 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 40 degrees Celsius to the rest of the world. And that's pretty hot for Western Oregon. I know that there's somebody living in Death Valley or Nevada that's gonna comment and say that I don't know what it's like to actually be hot. And it's true, I might not, but for us, this is pretty warm. And so first thing in the morning, we got it out there. It was as cool as it's gonna be. We had two cameras rolling, so we didn't wanna miss anything. And I was just winging it. I didn't know what was gonna happen. And then this happened. It actually started to bend in the sun. That's a time-lapse, but I was blown away. I was so freaking excited that it actually worked. And so now I got some ratchet straps out and I was just gonna to try to help it along. And I was shocked at how well this was working. I was blown away because it was completely flexible and I could have pushed it probably all the way at that point, but I was afraid of cracking it and I had the entire day to go. So I let that time-lapse run. It actually got so hot that both of our cameras shut off in the shade, but here's how it's looking. This is totally gummy. And now the only thing I'm worried about is if it's actually gonna be consistent and if it gets too hot to crack the epoxy. And I did continue to check the temperature of the epoxy, which got to about 135 degrees Fahrenheit, which I don't know what that is in Celsius. I'll probably put it up on the screen, but there we go. We got it all the way down and this is the next morning. <laughs> there we go. Never ever thought this would work. All right, we gotta get it out of the sun now. All right, it's been about three days since coming out of the form and initially everything looks really good. There's no major creases, there's no cracks or anything like that. When you look a little closer, you start seeing some of the imperfections though. There's a little bit of distortion on one side versus the other. There's a couple of creases where I had the clamps clamp without any towels under them. It's a perfect 90 right down the middle, but then if you get off just to the sides, it's just off of a little bit from a perfect 90. So not terrible for a first attempt, but definitely not perfect. The simplest way for me to finish this probably would have been just to sand it lightly up to about 180, maybe 240 grit, and then spray it with something like a lacquer or a varnish. However, I just don't think that looks quite as cool as when something is polished all the way up. So what I'm gonna do is I'm taking it from this 80 grit all the way up to 3000 grit, and then I'm gonna buff it with automotive compounds. And this will be the worst sanding job of my life, and I feel like I probably say that in multiple videos, but this is the undisputed new champion of horrible sanding projects. And here, I good thing I have about $2,000 in sanders because now I get to use all the little odd ones I have, like that little Rotex 90 that actually did a really nice job at getting in the curves there. And this bigger Rotex, the Rotex 150, did a really nice job of kind of smoothing out some of those dimples and dents that I showed you earlier from where the clamps had kind of compressed that epoxy and did a surprising job of smoothing it out. I wanted to stick with this theme of using just these soft edges and so I bought this half inch roundover bit and it was actually surprisingly hard to find a half inch roundover bit for a quarter inch chuck, which is this little trim router I have here. You can see why I had to use the trim router because I had to teeter it on this little edge here. I do have larger routers that would have worked better with better dust collection or I should say epoxy collection, but this is what I had come up with. And this was pretty messy. And by the way, that new respirator I have there, it's pretty freaking cool. There's a link in the video description for it if you're interested in it. It's one of my favorite respirator purchases of the last, probably ever actually, and it is really, really expensive though, so be forewarned that it is not cheap. And here's the mess that I made. This was just a couple epoxy shavings, and we really sped this up because this was a pretty long process to get this whole thing completely rounded over. About a year ago, I took a pretty big gamble. I spent about 30 hours or so creating a script and a step-by-step -step game plan. I hired an outside film crew and we spent about 40 hours or so filming my virtual epoxy workshop. And the reason this was a gamble is I probably could have made two or three, maybe even four YouTube videos in that amount of time. But people were always asking me to bring back my epoxy workshops because I used to do them in person. But I had so many people that couldn't fly from across the country or across the world 
and wanted to have a good resource on how to build a wood and epoxy table. So I committed myself to this plan and it was something that I didn't want to miss a single step. So there was a lot of work that went into it. I even did kind of live sessions when I was filming it with Instagram so I could get live feedback in real time. So if there was a question that the audience had that I might not have thought of, I could answer that just like I was doing a live class. And it's something I'm really proud of. And to be honest, I was completely blown away by the response. I have had so many more people sign up for it than I expected. And if you are interested in it, you can watch it over and over again. You can just watch a single chapter. You can rewatch multiple chapters. It's just something I am incredibly proud of. And if you're interested, often I'm running a promotion, so check the link in the description and see if there's a current promotion going on right now. I was recently on TikTok and I was watching the Southern Craftsman and he said, hey, I know everybody's seen this trick a thousand times, but if you don't know how to mark your line, here's how to properly do it. Don't put your square up to the line and then mark it. You put your pen or pencil up to the line and then bring the square directly to that. And I'm embarrassed to say I had never seen that trick before, which is what you saw me do when I marked this acrylic leg here. So thanks to the Southern Craftsman for showing me a trick that apparently I should have known years ago. In my last video, I mentioned that I have an upcoming project that didn't involve any wood whatsoever. And spoiler, it's not actually this project. There is still wood to come as part of this project. So stay tuned for that. But I showed this quick clip and I said, if anybody could guess what it was, I would send them a prize. And it ended up being a wood and epoxy cutting board. And it only took an hour. And a guy by the name of Mr. Cody Full correctly guessed that I am going to attempt to restore a real life woolly mammoth tusk. And here's a clip of it now. And here's a shot of what I hope to make it look like, which is not one that I've done before. And it's something totally new to me. I think it's going to be awesome. Some people are wildly confused about why anybody would want to attempt this. I think it is really, really cool. And I hope you'll stick with me and I promise I'm not gonna to pivot to a fossil channel or anything like this. It's just something that I am personally fascinated with and I can't wait to tackle this woolly mammoth tusk. And congrats to Cody on getting the answer correct. This is the fun part and it's also the nerve wracking part because this is when the epoxy really comes alive. This is when you polish it up and you can see right through it but you'll also be able to see any standing imperfections that you made along the way. So going all the way from 80 grit up to 3000 grit, there's a very good chance that I missed something. And once you polish it, you'll see these little pigtail swirls and horrible scratches in there. And so far it's looking pretty good. This is the extreme heavy cut stuff with a wool buffing pad. And it gets a lot shinier than this, but so far I'm pretty inspired thinking that it's coming together pretty nicely. And it's really starting to look more like blown glass than epoxy, which is not something I expected. So at this point, I'm feeling pretty good. I got the stage one out and now it's really starting to buff to a high gloss until Scott pointed this out. What, what's that? Is that? God damn it. Well, what Scott, my video guy, just pointed out, and thank you for that, by the way, Scott, I have a giant clamp footprint in the middle of this that somehow didn't get sanded out during the entire sanding and polishing process, and it's got the perfect microfiber imprint from when it was in the form in the sun. My only theory is that when we heated it up during this polishing process, it got that plastic memory from when it was clamped in the sun and kind of sprung back into shape. I have no idea if that's true. If you are a plastics chemist, definitely let me know in the comments because I, I can't imagine how I would have missed that sanding. But now I'm going to sand it down and try to fix it. Since this entire piece is already essentially fully polished, I wanted to be as gentle as possible when it comes to sanding. So I only went down to 1500 grit, which as it turns out was just aggressive enough to completely remove that stamp. Now the only question is, does it come back when I heat it up in the polishing process? What do you think? It's gonna come back? I'm, I have no clue. What do you think? Uh, I don't know. I look like I know what I'm doing. I know for sure, I know for sure it's gone. I don't know if it's gonna spring back. All right, there's nothing.
Part of me is tempted to really push it to see how hot I can get it to see if it comes back. But part of me wants to go really slow and not get it hot. Because right now it looks good. Um, so how curious am I? As it turns out, I was not quite curious enough to really push the polishing process to see if there actually was something in the chemistry of this table that would cause that plastic memory to spring back if I got it just hot enough. So proceeded rather cautiously with the rest of the polishing process. And about now I started to wonder about a name for this table because it's not really a waterfall table. It's not really an epoxy table, at least the epoxy table that we normally think of. And I asked my friend Chris over at Four Eyes Furniture what he thought I should call it. And he said that I should call it the Peroni's table, but doesn't really resemble any type of Russian meat pie, so I don't even know what he's getting at there. But if you have a suggestion for a name, I would love to hear it. So any ideas you have, I would love it if you left me the suggestions in the comments. And if I end up using that as the future name of this table, I will definitely give you a shout out in a future video. This is a clear piece of acrylic I bought up at Tap Plastics, and it's actually much nicer than it looks underneath that clear protective wrap they sell them with. And this is an idea my wife had. She suggested I keep everything very modern, very transparent with this clear acrylic and the clear blue table. And this piece was actually really, really expensive. It was like $240 for that one chunk of acrylic, which if you know my wife is generally pretty fitting. And I was a little nervous though about how I was gonna attach it because I didn't think straight epoxy on epoxy was gonna be strong enough. So I wanted to have a little bit of mechanical force in there too. So what I came up with is this jig is it fits a bushing for my router just perfectly so that bushing clicks into that jig i have a half inch router bit and as i plunge it down it should leave a perfect half inch hole and the idea here is this will allow me to use some clear acrylic dowels that are also half inch and when i use the same template on my table everything should line up just perfectly and i'll have that kind of mechanical reinforcement I was pretty nervous cutting this small round piece of acrylic because I wasn't certain it wouldn't shatter or shoot back into my face, but a normal crosscut blades seemed to work well. And to make sure I had three dowels the exact same length, I used my Cat's Moses stop block. And now I have three pieces the exact size I need that'll fit perfectly into those holes. However, when I started looking at that piece and looking at that piece, I couldn't bring myself to put my router into that epoxy table. So I scrapped the idea of using that acrylic leg and here is the wood leg I'm gonna use instead. I had an idea for a single table leg that would really match the style with those kind of soft rounded edges and kind of modern design, but I didn't wanna use regular boring wood. And by boring wood, I just mean wood that I've used a million times before. So no walnut, no maple, no anything like that. This is a piece of zebra wood. I actually went down to the woodcraft just down the street from me and I rifled through everything they had and I got this eight quarter, two inch thick piece of zebra wood. And it's a really, really beautiful wood species and one that I've never used before, but pretty excited about it. But there's still the question of, will a single table leg actually balance this thing from behind? So have to see if I can pull this off, but first just some normal jointing and planing. This is actually a jointer I'll be giving away in a local giveaway here pretty soon because I just got a new one from Oliver. This is an 8-inch Shop Fox one. Totally decent, so stay tuned for details on that jointer giveaway too. Just like before, I nipped the edges off with the bandsaw, came over to the router table, but this time I believe I used an inch and a half radius bit and I felt that this looked a little bit better since it was a much smaller piece. I didn't want to use the same large radius that I used on the table. But now is where it gets really interesting because there is very, very little room for error with this mounting system that I'm going with. But if I pull it off, I will not have to put any holes into the table, which is my dream. So I've got my spots marked. I've got a Forstner bit in there that is a very specific size and you'll see why it has to be just so perfect in just a little bit. And also at this point, you don't wanna blow out the other side. So I have it clamped down, which should prevent any blowout. I went almost all the way through and then finished it from the other side, leaving just that satisfying little disc there. I am well aware that most woodworkers do not have a bandsaw like I have here. And if they do have a bandsaw, it's probably not as nice as this one, which I've only had for a couple of months now. But one thing that any woodworker can do 
is build jigs. You can use jigs and a router to build almost anything. Make a bunch of sleds for your table saw. It is incredible the things that people come up with that enable their table saw to become multifunction tools. And if you still need some industrial tools, if you still need tools that aren't available through using a jig, I actually made a website a few months ago. It's called makerbook.io. And it's kind of like a Uber for tools, except for the fact I don't make any money on it. I actually lose money having this website. But what it does is enables anybody with a small shop, create a listing and they can rent out their shop space, their time, their tools. So if you don't have the tools and you just need to use it for 30 minutes or an hour, there's probably someone local to you that'll rent your shop out, rent the tool out to you and enable you to woodwork without actually having to make that big upfront investment of the expensive tools. So I'll include a link in the description, but again, it's makerbook.io. The finish that I'm using here is a water-based poly, which is a really difficult finish to brush on. And I actually recently got an HVLP gun, but I've just been too nervous to use it. So it's still in the box and I'm trying to build up the courage to actually learn how to use it. And here, this took a few coats and a little bit of sanding in between, but it looks really, really nice. This is how I'm actually going to attach it. Well, I'm not actually going to use adhesive on this to the table, but what I'm using here is contact cement. And then I have this kind of sticky felt pad and there is adhesive on the felt itself, but this contact cement adhesive is really, really strong. So I thought it would be a little bit more durable. And so it took a little bit of wiggling, trying not to ruin the finish with that adhesive, got it stuck on there and I let it cure for a little while before I came back to trim it up. It seems like at this point of any project is always when I get in a hurry and instead of just nice and easily trimming this, I run the X-Acto knife right into the side of the wood and end up having to sand it down and redo it. So tried to show some restraint because I was so close to finally being done with this project. And there's an old build of mine that is currently in our house. And here is the staging spot for this video. The epoxy looks really, really good. It's not perfect, like I said before. However, the fit on this, is pretty perfect. I'm actually really proud of that. I think that's pretty cool. And I know this isn't for everybody. I know it's a unique style. I think it's pretty unique. I'm really excited about it. It's one of the favorite things that I've ever built and I'm giving it away. It's open to anybody in the world. There's a link in the video description. It's not super stable on carpet, but it's actually pretty stable on solid ground. It's really stable. Okay. It's really stable on solid ground, but if you are interested in that, there's a link in the video description. And oh yeah, I even made some custom zebra wood coasters for it so you don't have to damage the finish. Anyway, let me know what you think. I'm really, really proud of this one. Every week I like to give a little bit of credit to people who make it all the way to the end of the video. So this week, start your question or comment with either old or new to let me know whether you prefer the old end table or the new end table. As always, thank you so much. Have a great week.